Good morning. I am greatly honored to introduce Dr. Segenet Kelemu. Dr. Kelemu is an Ethiopian scientist noted for her research as a molecular plant pathologist. She has served in key positions in high profile science organizations and has received numerous international awards, just to name a few. She received the 2014 L'Oréal UNESCO for Women in Science Award. The People's Republic of China gave her the Friendship Award for her contribution to China's economic and social development. The Academy of Sciences for the Developing World gave her an award in 2011. Dr. Kelemo has published widely in refereed journals and other reputable academic locations. Her scholarship includes publications on edible insects, prediction of breeding regions for the desert locust, and genetic diversity. Dr. Kelemo is the director of the International Center of Insect Physiology and Ecology in Nairobi, Kenya. One of their research activities focuses on the well-being of bees. They want to find out what makes African bees more resilient, more tolerant of diseases. This research would have an impact beyond the African continent. Dr. Kelemu's research helps us understand how plants endure so many challenges, drought, herbivores, pests, climate change. She wants to keep farmers from devastating losses by better understanding the biotic, symbiotic relationship between plants and insects. She believes that insects play a great role in our lives, that they are a great contributor to food security, for instance, by being big pollinators, but that they also have damaging impacts. They destroy crops in pre- and post-harvest periods and transmit diseases to humans, animals, and crops. Please let us welcome Dr. Kelmo to the podium. Yeah. for the slide. No? Okay. Okay, until I get it for the slide. Okay, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, so English is one of the most tortured languages spoken around the globe uh, in so many different uh, accents. Uh, so please prepare to adjust your understanding of Ethiopian accent, influenced by other languages, weird and non-weird languages I speak. So I thank the organizers for uh, uh, this opportunity for inviting me to this flawlessly organized uh, uh, conference. Uh, so uh, it's really a great pleasure to be here. So before I go into, uh, into my main talk, I want to talk about uh, why insects. I say this because people often ask me, what do you do for a living? I say, I'm a scientist. Oh my God, then you are too smart to talk to. Uh, uh, then what exactly do you do in science? I said I run an organization, a uh, research for development organization focused on insects. You mean the entire organization focused on these tiny insects? Uh, I say yes. Uh, so they don't ask what are insects, because everybody knows insects, right? Then the next question is why insects? So with a tone, with a, a connotation that why do you waste millions of dollars and effort on these tiny useless insects? So I think uh, the organizers, they, they coined these insects little 
Body Big Impact. It's a beautiful title. Thanks, Marguerite. Uh, so I'm going to tell you today that really big impact is really true. And I will, I'm going to give you some examples. But why insects? Because many of them are beneficial. There are estimated 10 quintillion insects, the most abundant animals on Earth. But uh, the vast majority are useful. Only a small fraction are harmful. They are great indicators for environmental change. They are beautiful in the landscape. They decompose uh, uh, waste that we generate. Uh, and, uh, and without insects and microbes decomposing this waste, actually, our planet would be a really stinky mess. And they are also extremely hardworking uh, companions, hardworking on the farm, pollinating lots of our food. Uh, and they themselves are also good in the food web. Uh, like I think as the speaker yesterday told you how many uh, insects have up to 800 million tons are consumed by spiders alone. And birds also alone consume up to 500 million tons of insects annually. Just imagine that. They also generate, give us fabric. Uh, uh, and and uh, through, uh, uh, by insect, uh, by uh, silkworms. But there are also other roles insects play. The insects, nobody uh, said yesterday about uh, the role of insects in forensic science. When uh, uh, detectives try to determine the, uh, a homicide, when a person died, often that insects are used in a decomposing body uh, to determine the, the time of death, the de uh, based on their life cycle of the decomposing maggot. Uh, also, insects have been also inspirational in designing new uh, equipment, medical equipment, based on wasps, for example. Wasps have a special way, structured like a needle that goes into their uh, predator, their, uh, their prey, to, uh, in a sophisticated way, to go in and deposit uh, eggs. Uh, so a medical equipment has been designed based on that uh, structure. Uh, they have been also inspirational in uh, designing helicopters. For example, dragonflies, they they maneuver while flying at uh, high speed. Um, there, I think you have seen many jewelries this week, uh, de uh, designed, inspired by different uh, uh, insect designs, uh, fabrics in, and so on. Robots have been also designed based on uh, ant, ants and uh, many, many ways. And I think we can also learn social behavior from social insects also, teamwork, uh, discipline, organizational skills. So there is a lot that we can insect, uh, we can learn from insects. So I think uh, I have to take up this opportunity also to uh, introduce you the International Center of Insect uh, Physiology and Ecology, the only uh, research for development organization, not only just in Africa, but in the world, focused on insects. Uh, so this was uh, a founded in uh, uh, more than 50 years ago, about 53, a little over 53 years ago, by uh, a Kenyan entomologist, Thomas Odiambo. He was the first CEO uh, and uh, served the center for 20 years, 23 years, followed by uh, a Swiss entomologist, Hans Heeren, then a German entomologist, Christian Borgmeister, and uh, me currently, uh, uh, running the center, a fascinating center. We are about uh, a little over 630 uh, regular staff from 40 nationalities and uh, some other contracted workers. I think the major workforce, the movers and shockers, uh, shakers of the discovery we do in insects and insect-related uh, science are our graduate students. We don't give them a degree, but uh, they are registered uh, in 85 plus uh, partner universities around the globe, uh, but they do their research with us. So a lot of the discoveries are, are actually made by them. Uh, 
Our mission is uh, uh, to solve to alleviate poverty, ensure food security, and improve the overall health uh, status of peoples of the tropics by developing and extending management tools uh, uh, for uh, harmful and uh, also useful arthropods. Uh, so uh, this is our mission. We do high caliber, high quality basic science, but we always translate it to impact to make a difference in people's lives. So, uh, so we, uh, we use insects, but in four, uh, around four thematic areas, in human health, in plant and animal health, and environmental health, often in a way to combine this in one health approach. And we have, as I said, a huge capacity building that cut across. We don't do this in isolation. We have more than 300 partners around the world. We are a, the regional center for Stockholm Convention, a regional center uh, for reduction of pesticides. We are also FAO reference center for uh, vectors and vector-borne diseases in animals, and also for uh, the uh, a center collaborating center in bee health in Africa for uh, a World Organization for Animal Health and, and, and so on. Uh, so you see all this also in our top of the buildings um, of uh, solar panel. Uh, we have made the whole campus 100% solar. Uh, so that was one of the infrastructure upgrade I have done. Uh, thanks to the government of the Switzerland for, for um, uh, financing that. So uh, let me just give you context. Context is always important. Uh, so let me give you some context that our way of li life uh, globally is very unsustainable. It's very destructive. We generate millions of tons of food waste, most of it 60% coming from households. We waste a lot of food. We uh, produce also animals that we farm, produce billions of tons of manure. Uh, we, uh, the brewery uh, industry produces a lot of millions of tons of waste. Uh, the thousands of potato chips that we enjoy generate thousands of, uh, of tons of peel, potato peel, uh, and so on. So to manage that also waste is a multi-billion dollar also business and, and so on. So we are very destructive, we are wasteful, we, we are messy in our way of life. So, uh, and to also feed a lot of our uh, desire to eat a lot of meat, we use a lot of soya for the feed, for animal feed. And, uh, so to meet that demand, a lot of trees are being cut uh, in Brazil to get way to produce more soya as the demand grows. Uh, so the Amazon forest, for example, in the last 10 years, uh, about the size of a small island nation, 1,000 square kilometer area of forest has been uh, cleared. About, uh, to make even matters worse, about 36% of the fish that is being fished also uh, is used not for human food, but macerated and produced for animal feed as protein source, instead of going to human food. So why am I telling you this? All this I told you and more, we are using the mighty, tiny black soldier fly to clean up the waste, produce high quality uh, protein, uh, anim uh, insect protein, and replace soya and fish meal and other protein source for animal feed. That is a beautiful, beautiful way of, of creating sustainability. So this is a black soldier fly, how it looks like. The, what I'm showing you in the center is a larvae. The larvae produced on waste, on manure, on human waste, on, on brewery waste, on potato peel, on avocado waste, on any biological waste. Uh, so basically, you use a waste to produce, to rear these insects, black soldier flies, they multiply in mass in a very short period of time. We harvest the larvae, we process them, 
we feed the animals, uh, and uh, the remaining, the insect for us is high quality fertilizer. It's uh, the most sustainable way to live our life. And uh, this, um, this fertilizer also uh, that we produce, uh, fertilizer price is very, very high in Africa. So it is used in any uh, production system. It is uh, high quality, it's better than the commercial fertilizer. It also uh, improves the soil health as well. Uh, and the insects also, uh, during the, all this process also, uh, they are a good source of oil. We will never think of insects as a source of oil. The source of, uh, sorry, so I think, yeah. The oil, again, the oil, the cooking oil, the cosmetic industry uses a lot of oil. The, lots of the oil also comes from plant-based, uh, uh, is plant-based. So it, me, it needs a lot of uh, water, a lot of uh, uh, land, and so on. But the insect source, the insect oil, is also extremely high quality. It, is, uh, it has omega-3, it has antioxidants, and you can produce a lot of products. So, so these are some of the products generated at ICP and passed it to the private sector. Soap, the omega source oil, the cooking oil, some of this oil also, particularly from the black soldier fly, can be used also as a diesel, diesel oil as well. And it's, it's, it's absolutely fantastic. You can use also the oil to cook or to as lotion. I use some of the oil for my hair. Uh, so it's, it's absolutely beautiful. So, but also the other thing that we discovered is uh, when you feed uh, insect larvae to chicken, you can actually change the microbiome content in their guts, and making them more resilient. And also, there is no need to add antibiotics in the feed. Antibiotics in the feed, so uh, resilient, disease resistant, and so on. So we would like also to see. How, whether we can change the microbiome of people who are on a regular insect diet. We would like to see that, actually. Uh, so this is extremely um, uh, sustainable. So based on our work, this is not a theory. Now, in East Africa alone, more than a thousand private sector has been sprouting in uh, producing uh, black soldier fly for animal feed. So all these dots you see, in the different countries are where the companies are concentrated. So this, this gentleman with the jacket is actually the former president of Kenya. Uh, uh, he skipped one Sunday uh, from church to visit one of the companies. So immediately he said, oh my God, I'm going to actually do this in, uh, in his farm, he said. So currently about 10% of the total requirement of Kenya Kenya's animal protein uh, for feed is uh, insect-based, and it is growing. Uh, so this is an unbelievable uh, innovation that uh, has been uh, uh, extremely popular. We train a lot of people in this, uh, but we can't keep up with the request, the demand. Um, so what happens then to the plastic waste we generate? Uh, so we can clean all the mess, the biological waste. So I have been pushing uh, uh, my, uh, my team to look for also to diversify the, the type of insects we have for feed. So during that search, they have identified a, a, a worm, African lesser mealworm, that can degrade plastic completely, completely to its uh, compound level. So uh, you can see uh, in this graph about 70% uh, survival on just plastic alone uh, or after 30 days living on plastic. So it's not then they found out that uh, it's not the, inse the uh, insect is still uh, chewing it, but they have microbes inside that degrade this, uh, uh, these plastics. So it is amazing to be uh, an insect scientist. So for food, look at this variety of beautiful uh, 
uh, delicacy across Africa. So I always say that uh, the next scramble for Africa is not going to be just for it is minerals, it is cobalt, it is uh, uranium, it is uh, diamond. It's going to be for the variety of insects that uh, Africa generates, edible insects. So I think any five-star chef would like these colorful things on their plate. Uh, it's just really wonderful, the variety. Uh, so there are more than 2,000 species of uh, edible insects globally. And about estimated 2 billion people have been consuming insects traditionally in Africa, Asia, Latin America. And more than 550 of them uh, are uh, species are in Africa. And this dark spot here is a hot spot of uh, insect diversity in Africa. So what we had done was to do survey in Africa, all the edible insects, and we did chemical analysis to see the the protein content, the mineral content, and so on. So most of these edible insects actually have much higher protein content than the animal and plant source uh, 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 proteins. So many, many countries also, they are short of uh, nutrition, fulfilling nutrition requirements for their population. So. And we found out that insects are extremely rich in minerals and in zinc and iron. In many uh, remote corners of poor countries, actually women, uh, pregnant women who need extra uh, iron, they actually eat dirt to get the extra iron they need. So that is absolutely no, not needed because a lot of these edible insects have more than the uh, recommended daily allowance of uh, a lot of these minerals. Um, so we have also generated a lot of uh, insect-based uh, 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 products. You can see for food, the iron, the uh, protein uh, bars, uh, the feed products for fish, for chicken, for uh, pigs, uh, fertilizer products. Uh, plant also uh, protection products from chitins of insects and the oil products, uh, a multitude of things. So this actually is, uh, we believe, is the future. It generates a lot of income, it generates a lot of products, it generates also jobs. Many, many uh, jobs are now being created in this uh, industry. Uh, so I'm absolutely really, really happy that how we are changing the, the, the continent and influencing also the world. And this is a program that I established when I first started at the company 10 years ago. And we do this successfully because we, 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 we work together with governments, policy makers, influencing policy, educating policy makers, politicians, and developing uh, standards and policies that accept this. So currently, Kenya, Rwanda, Tanzania, Uganda, Ethiopia uh, have officially accepted this, and, and companies are flourishing. And we are working now uh, with African Union to develop that. So, but some countries are not waiting for their governments to approve. Uh, so as you can see in this uh, uh, map of Africa, so now 14 species are farmed as edible insects, and there are over 2,300 black soldier fly farmers, producers in Africa, producing the larvae for insect, for animal feed. So this is the fastest growing technologies that we have generated, and the most impactful, and I think is, uh, so Australia recently funded us, also the government, to take this technology to the Pacific countries, to the islands, to, uh, with our support to expand that. And, and, and so uh, FDA had approved also a few years ago. Uh, European Union has approved. So this is the future. We are not pushing it just for Africa, but I think for uh, the whole world, because the whole world is, uh, is, needs this. Um, so this uh, whole circular economy uh, 
uh, you know, contributes to many uh, sustainable development goals. And this is in the environment, in plant health, in animal human health. And we uh, won the, the global food planet prize, which came with $1 million for this innovative research to, in 2020, December. And we went to Sweden to celebrate it uh, last year because uh, of COVID, we couldn't go. But we spent the money already. Uh, so, so, and in the last uh, five years, uh, the, our work, uh, not only this, but overall, other parts of work also, we won 155 individual and institutional awards. And together, the insects won the award as well with us. So it's, a, it's a, an uplifting, uplifting uh, uh, area to be in insect science. So the second uh, example I will give you is a technology that was developed at ECPA some 20 years ago called the push-pull technology. This was a technology developed to control uh, a very major uh, insect pest of uh, the staple crop maize called stem borer. It is a very a simple approach, but scientifically really complex, uh, complex one. So uh, this uses two companion plants, uh, intercropped one as a border of the, your uh, target crop, and the other one uh, intercropped with, with your target uh, uh, plant crop. So there's a lot of chemistry involved here. Uh, so I don't understand it myself, and I'm not going to expect you to understand it. But what was really amazing is that uh, the companion plants, uh, one of them called Desmodium, uh, produces naturally uh, uh, compounds into volatiles into the air. We don't smell it, but the insects smell it, and they don't like it. So they run away from the crop, uh, from that plant, which is push. The border plant, the grass, produces other set of compounds that the insects smell and like it, they are attracted to it. But then when they lay their eggs, they find out that actually it's not a, it's a wrong host. And so the egg doesn't hatch, so the life cycle uh, finishes. So, so this is how in real life looks like. The trap, the push plant along with the maze in the center, and then the grass around is a and the border to attract the insect. So the, both these companion plants are high quality animal fodder. It's a beautiful system for African uh, uh, crop livestock mixed uh, production system. But the science is fascinating. But uh, over then the years, we discovered this system doesn't just only control insects, it controls one of the most food security uh, threats of Africa, Striga weed. This is a parasitic weed. Uh, this uh, beautiful purple uh, flowers. So looks are deceiving. It doesn't have uh, roots, so they have minute seeds that can stay in the soil for 20, 30 years until they find the, the uh, exudate from the roots of the host and they detect it, they germinate, they go, they attach themselves to the root, and they suck the life out of the crop. So all this you see, dead. You see all these women bending, trying to hand weed all day long to remove that, but the crop is already gone. So what makes me so happy is that this technology works for this, like in the same way that, uh, in a different way that uh, it works for, uh, for um, uh, insects. So you can see this now. This is not, this is real. So here, the lady is the same lady. Before adapting the push pull technology, completely her maze is gone. This is starvation, basically. And then, in one season, with the technology, you have this healthy maze. Uh, so this is, so this technology was uh, highlighted by the UN Secretary General as one of the most innovative uh, uh, production system created ever in science. And I'm so proud it was generated in Africa by Africans. So, yeah, thank you. Thank you. 
So these technologies now over 15 countries are adopted and produced. And one of the most up uplifting things is when I go to the field, talk to all these women, and they tell me how this changed their lives. One time I was talking to uh, uh, women farmers in Ethiopia who adopted this. And one of them told me, oh, thank you, madam, that this changed my life. They did this uh, and, and so on. And then she says, uh, but it's not you who gave us, it is God who gave us this gift. I said, no problem, I work in partnership with God. So <laughs> she didn't like that joke, so don't joke about religion. So, so, um, so because this has been successful and we have developed it now with, uh, with a six, seven million dollar grant, uh, we are developing it for vegetables as well. Because this is women, crop, uh, it has a multitude of uh, pests and so on. We are developing it successfully for vegetables. So this is one of the technologies that can handle multiple, multiple constraints, major constraints in production system. Uh, insect uh, stem borers, fall army worm, uh, weeds, uh, it's a fodder plant, it uh, does climate change mitigation and and uh, adaptation, soil fertility improvement, because one of the companion plants uh, naturally fixes nitrogen, so you don't have to apply fertilizer. So it's, it's uh, I, I don't, it really makes me jump, you know. Uh, so it also controls uh, aflatoxin, mycotoxins. Mycotoxins are common globally, and more predominantly in Africa. So the mycotoxins are carcinogen, they uh, cause stunting in children, but uh, also if it is in high concentration also it can kill people. So this can solve that also, um, and so on. So what tells you is that nature works in, in, in sync. So you develop one effective uh, technology for one to f uh, one thing, and then it solves a lot of other things. And then I think this is, but this is once in a lifetime discovery. And this is a technology that keeps on giving. We still don't know everything about what this does actually. Uh, the last example I'm going to give you is ex again, exciting, exciting, exciting discovery made in, 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 in our institution. Malaria. Malaria is an old disease. Uh, the rest of the world has managed to eradicate it, but I think recently it popped in, uh, in uh, Florida, I believe. Um, this is an old disease. It has changed history. Uh, if you read about the history of Panama Canal, so Panama Canal, the French started building it, but malaria completely devastated their workers, engineers, killing more than 20,000 people, so they had to abandon that project, and the Americans took over, tried to disinfect uh, uh, and stabilize the situation, because they did not know, at that time, it was not known that it was mosquitoes that transmitted. it. But eventually, in 1904 or so, Americans discovered that it is the mosquitoes that transmit the disease, uh, both malaria and uh, yellow fever, which are deadly, both of them. And so, but malaria is still is a killer in Africa. More than 90% of the incidents are in Africa. Uh, so a child even today dies every, every two minutes from malaria, and this is not acceptable. So all the existing technologies control measures now have plateaued. The mosquitoes are getting smarter, they are uh, biting earlier and outdoor, and transmitting and killing uh, people. So we started, we have a major uh, malaria program. We started working, uh, we have many, many uh, uh, different uh, uh, research area, but w this was uh, a, basically an accidental discovery by one of the students. So, in the area where there is an endemic uh, presence of malaria, uh, the mosquitoes that naturally harbor a microbe, a fungus, 
called microsporidia cannot transmit uh, malaria. 100% transmission blockage. This was like, are you kidding me? This was a wow, wow moment. Uh, so you, you can see these uh, red ones in the microscope, uh, under the microscope. These are the microsporidia associated in the, in the insect, in the mosquito. But uh, what was exciting is also that the mosquito, the female mosquito that harbors it, uh, she transmits the next generation through the egg, which is fantastic for, uh, for large-scale application. And then we later discovered, actually, it is also sexually transmitted. So the male mosquito that has it can transmit it also to the female during sexual mating. And you can see this red one where the microsporidia is penetrating in the embryo of the female mosquito in the ovaries. And then in the male, it is associated with the male gonad in the ejaculation duct of the male gonad. So it was evolutionary, evolutionarily designed for transmission and long-term also uh, maintenance. Uh, so this was great. So once we published this discovery, in, um, in nature, um, so a lot of uh, funding started flying uh, towards our door uh, so to control this. Uh, so the beauty of this also is that, uh, for, for example, in, for dengue uh, control, a, a, a Wilbachia, a bacterium, has been used for control of dengue at a large scale in Australia. So the results show, the preliminary results now, that uh, Wilbachia containing uh, uh, mosquitoes, actually uh, uh, you can reduce uh, dengue by 77%, and the reduction of also uh, hospitalization of dengue patients by 86%. So this is great. But the malaria, it is unique to us, so, but this is encouraging for us. Now, well, what we are doing is that a large-scale trial, semi-field trial, together with the regulators, to actually do, to determine what environmental factors influence this, how many male uh, infected, uh, 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 infected uh, uh, mosquitoes do we need to release, and what are the conditions we need. So a multidisciplinary team composed of uh, modelers, and ecologists, and entomologists, and molecular biologists are working now, more than 25 people on this. Uh, so we are really excited. And, but I think also the beauty of this also, the, for some reason, the female mosquitoes, they prefer to mate with male mosquitoes that have this uh, uh, microsporidia. The, uh, the fungal symbiont. So we are very excited with this. I think we are towards uh, eradicating this, uh, this uh, toxic disease, killer disease. Uh, so thank you. So these are the figures. The figures, the female mosquitoes, they prefer to mate uh, to, uh, with microsporidia containing male. We don't know the reason why. Why do they prefer that? So, uh, uh, but it is, then it will be really beautiful for us uh, for the large-scale uh, eradication uh, or application. Uh, so we also believe that for every problem, vector-borne diseases, there may be a symbiosis-based solution. So I think we are towards that major, major move to control other vector-borne diseases like Zika. You remember Zika? Uh, uh, and many, many other, uh, yellow fever and dengue and all others. So we are really excited. So it's, uh, I'm grateful to all the funders, uh, direct funders to, to us uh, who make all this possible. Um, 
So I just hope also that the students who are here, I think it's really fantastic to be a scientist. There is nothing more rewarding than using your skill to change lives, to solve global problems so when we have tons of global problems. Uh, a few years ago, when my daughter was uh, little, like four or five years old, she declared one day that, Mommy, Daddy, you guys are so boring. All you talk about is science, and you work so hard, and you are not even rich. So I will never be a scientist. <laughs> so we told her, no, you don't have to be a scientist, but uh, you can choose whatever. But uh, she ended up uh, being a scientist. So she's, <laughs> she's working now, her PhD on uh, dung beetles. Dung beetles uh, on the role they do on um, on um, what is it called, uh, nutrient cycling in Af African savannas. And I think she's going to be a spectacular scientist. She's really good. So, uh, so she will, yeah. So I encourage all of you to be scientists. That's what I'm uh, saying, or at least work with scientists to contribute to society. Thank you so much.